Welcome to Bed Crime Stories Podcast. I'm your host, T, and I hope you guys are all very, very well. Before I get started, please hit that like button. It's a huge help. I shared a call on my community page yesterday from someone named Chris Moyer, who posted it to his channel of the same name, Chris Moyer. The call is said to be between someone staying at the same facility in Indiana where Delphi suspect Richard Allen is now bunking as of Thursday, November 3rd, 2022. Allen was taken there for added security. For those of you who haven't heard that call, let me play a short snippet from it. So the person inside the facility later describes 30 or so state police officers bringing 50-year-old Allen into the prison and placing him in an observation cell. Observation cells are used for inmates who are considered at risk of unaliving themselves. I can't say the S word that ends with side, so that's why I'm saying that. 24-7 surveillance cameras offer guards a constant view of the prisoner. Of course, Jeffrey Epstein was said to be in such a cell, and look what happened to him. According to this person in the Indiana facility, no one except Allen's own prison officer can take food to him. I guess the authorities are afraid Allen will be harmed either by the food brought to him or the person delivering it. The person inside, the person on the phone, also said that Alan has been sleeping or pretending to sleep all day long. And as he's doing that, the other inmates within shouting distance are screaming, you're not safe anywhere. So obviously he's not getting a lot of rest, not that I care. This is disturbing to hear though on many levels. Make no mistake, if Alan is found to be bridge guy in a court of law, I say let him live with the karma he's forged for himself. But that cannot happen until he has a trial by jury. Not only does every citizen in the United States have that right, the families, most importantly, have the right to confront Richard Allen in the courtroom, to see the evidence and watch as Allen hears it too. This prison justice cannot, should not, happen because Libby and Abby's families, they're the ones who get to say what punishment they feel is most appropriate if Alan is convicted. At least I hope they get to say that. Please, let's not deny them their opportunity to feel the full force of justice. They've waited five and a half years for this. Libby Abby and their families are what matters the most, not our collective rage at this alleged monster. Now, I'm thinking this prison phone call is legitimate, and today's letter from Richard M. Allen to the court 
is quite the revelation as to where Alan's head is currently at. I'm going to read the letter to you right now and then break it down afterward. Here we go. In the cause listed above, I, Richard M. Allen, hereby throw myself at the mercy of the court. I'm begging to be provided with legal assistance in a public defender or whatever help is available. At my initial hearing on October 28th, 2022, I asked to find representation for myself. However, at the time, I had no clue how expensive it would be just to talk to someone. I also did not realize what my wife and I's immediate financial situation was going to be. We have both been forced to immediately abandon employment, myself due to incarceration, and my wife for her personal safety. She has had to abandon our house for her own safety. What little reserve there is will fail to even maintain the original residence. Again, I throw myself at the mercy of the court. Please provide me whatever assistance you may. Thank you for your time in this most urgent matter. Sincerely, Richard M. Allen. So this is exactly what I expected. I was pretty sure that Allen stating he would seek his own legal counsel when he was charged would later change to him asking for a public defender. I thought that because of the enormous costs it would involve for a private attorney to take on his case, Allen's only hope would be that some talented defense lawyer would take him on pro bono, meaning voluntarily and without pay. Someone like Jose Bias, who represented Casey Anthony, and who, by the way, is very much alive. I mistakenly said he was deceased in an earlier video. I'm not sure too many attorneys would want to represent Alan. Can you imagine the grief whoever does get stuck representing him will face? This case engenders so much emotion in people. We've all seen Bridge Guy, and we've all wondered who he would turn out to be. Now that the police have the person they believe responsible for Libby and Abby's deaths in their clutches, all our collective sadness and anger suddenly is pretty much focused like a laser beam on Richard Allen. And we've already seen the first judge assigned to Allen's case recuse himself from it, partially out of fear for his family's safety and partially out of panic at how many requests the small court in downtown Delphi was receiving to unseal the probable cause affidavit. A special judge was then appointed to the case, and my friend out there who asked me what a special judge is, it means a judge appointed to serve when a sitting judge is unable or unqualified to serve. So basically, a special judge really isn't all that special. They're just brought in in cases like this one when the first judge recuses himself or herself. Back to Allen and his defense. Any public defender unfortunate enough to be assigned to his case will likely be on the receiving end of some hate. Note that this will be totally unfair, unethical, and unacceptable because the public defender's job is to defend those who cannot afford private legal counsel. And most public defenders do not enjoy the same freedom as private attorneys when it comes to refusing a case. They can't just say, Ah, oh, heck no, I am not taking on that guy. Let's face it, Richard Allen, at least in true crime circles, is almost like an accused witch in Salem back in the day. The thirsty mob doesn't want to let him defend or explain himself or put up a fight. They just want to send him directly to the stake and throw a giant match on it sooner rather than later. Thank you very much. And if a jury finds Alan guilty, I think he should be made to suffer whatever punishment will prove most painful to him. This crime was so brutal and unspeakable that whoever is found guilty of committing it 
has pretty much lost his right to breathe, in my opinion. But let's wait until he gets his due process. It's something that is supposed to come with the privilege of being an American citizen. Back to Alan's letter. What jumps out at me is the way he uses language. He's well-spoken and exceedingly polite. Alan is not demanding a public defender like some brute. No, he's begging for one and asking for the court's mercy. In fact, he uses the word mercy two times in the letter. Hearing his words in this note makes it easy to understand why so many locals who interacted with him said how nice Richard Allen seemed, almost charming. Clearly, Allen knows how to express himself for his audience. In the CVS, he was helpful and kind. In JC's Bar and Grill, he was jovial and playful. We all saw his bizarre jig when his wife was filming him playing pool. But we also heard about him being drunk one night at home and his wife feeling upset enough to dial 911. Sounds like if you give Alan a few too many brewskis, the shiny facade might wear off and expose some cracks in the veneer. In this letter, Alan is being polite, deferential. It's almost like he's trying to appear small, powerless, vulnerable, and naive. He talks about having no clue how expensive it would be to talk to a private attorney. How different is this tone of voice to that of Bridge Guy, who demanded, likely with a weapon in hand, that Libby and Abby go down the hill? And remember, Superintendent Carter of the Indiana State Police, who spoke directly to the perpetrator back in 2017, said, To you, this is about power. Let's just imagine for a second that Richard Allen is bridge guy and that he's been found guilty of the crime through a jury trial. If we think of that, then this letter is indicative of his ability to skillfully manipulate other people. By saying how he and his wife were forced to abandon their jobs, Allen is making it clear that he feels victimized by his arrest and charges. He's basically making it seem as if he's been put in this sorry state of affairs by an outside force, not because of his own actions and demons. He further tries to engender pity by saying that his wife has had to flee their home for her own personal safety. He says she's had to abandon their home. Now on that last part, I do feel badly for the wife, if she really had no clue. She should not be held accountable for her husband's sins, if she had no clue. And we know that wives of serialists like Dennis Rader can be totally clueless and really not know what their husbands were up to. Alan signs off with, Thank you for your time in this most urgent matter. Sincerely, Richard M. Allen. Does that not sound like a line from someone in a Charles Dickens novel? Perhaps Pip in Great Expectations? To me, Alan is coming across like an actor in this letter, and it's making me think he may have the stuff to pull off a heinous crime like this one, all the while smiling at the pharmacy counter in the CVS. Until the next time on Bed Crime Stories.